Thank God for you all who are joining today. This is Dr. Willie Nutt with San Jose Word of Faith Christian Center, and we're going to be starting a new Bible study uh, today. Uh, I think this is going to really bless you. Uh, the title of the message is going to be Glorifying God. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for those who are time chimed in today. We ask that this program will be a blessing to them, that they'll learn some things that they were not aware of, Lord God. I ask for the anointing, supernatural recall of your word, and don't flush my glory in your sight. In Jesus' name. The title of the message again is Glorifying God. And uh, it is uh, found in uh, uh, Isaiah 61, uh, chapters 1 to 3. We're going to launch from there. Uh, it's a message that probes the benefits uh, that comes to us from glorifying God. A lot of people don't stop to think about that. Uh, we're more concerned about how God glorifies us and blesses us. But uh, if you want to receive the full bounty that God has for you, you need to learn how to praise, adore, and to glorify his name. And probably the best place to talk about this is, as I stated, Isaiah uh, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. And as we always do, we'll be going uh, from uh, throughout the entire Bible. I'm not a one scripture pastor. I believe that the entire word of God that relates should be declared as appropriate. And so we'll be going to various other places in the word of God too to make sure you have a thorough knowledge of how we glorify God. Let us read uh, Isaiah 61, chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. It reads as follows. It says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And, of course, this is uh, Isaiah speaking prophetically. And actually he's talking about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he reiterates this when he gets in the book of Luke, uh, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 19, a portion of what we're going to read today. is recited by Jesus Christ and in reference to himself. So, Actually, Isaiah is talking about the Lord Jesus, and also, uh, by implication, he's saying some things that pertains to we who are believers today who follow uh, the Lord Jesus. So let me read again, Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prisons to them that are bound. Second verse, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, uh, to comfort all that mourn. Portion of that scripture is not going to be fulfilled till the end of this age, but I'll point it out at the uh, appropriate time. The Lord Jesus, during his earthly sojourn, as I stated earlier, reiterated Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3 in Luke uh, the fourth chapter 18 through 19. Uh, I may uh, as we go through this study um, actually recite that but you can go there yourself and read it and you find that it uh, is quite similar to what was prophesied here from the mouth of Isaiah the prophet. So here uh, he says when he stood before the Jews gathered there in the synagogue on the Sabbath day uh, later on during his earthly sojourn Jesus recited these words that we just read. He quoted just the first two verses of Isaiah, letting us know through the prophet Isaiah Christ's purpose for coming to the earth realm as the Messiah. So we're going to focus on his purpose for coming to the world uh, as the Messiah. And then later on, we may, uh, as we get to the end of this session where we talk about uh, glorifying God, talk about the other aspects of this opening verse. I want to continue with the words of Isaiah. In the third verse, Isaiah 61 and 3, uh, which was not quoted uh, in um, Luke, the fourth chapter, verses 18 through 19. It says, To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that uh, they, these are those who mourn in, in Zion, and we'll talk about that momentarily, might be called trees of righteousness. Really, he's talking about we who are believers today, that we will ultimately be called trees of righteousness. Uh, the planting will be the planting of the Lord. So we're like planting, plantlings, or trees, uh, that he might be glorified. So we are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that we might be, that he, notice this, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. So the Lord gets glorified from we being planted as trees uh, in his garden. Oftentimes when we examine the word of God, we are seeking to find scriptures that promises for achieving a life of abundance and blessing. 
uh, although it is true that the blessings in the Word of God are uh, the believer's legacy. So uh, it's true that the blessings that the Lord has mentioned in the Word of God throughout the Testament, the Judeo-Christian Bible, and primarily for us that we can have an abundant life uh, and a life of blessing. Although it is true that the blessings in the Word of God are for us, there is a symbolic relationship, a symbiotic, uh, let me say it again, symbiotic uh, relationship that occurs between recipients of God's grace and God. So there's some benefit that goes back and forth, mutual benefit for those who are believers, and also the Lord is receiving benefit too in us glorifying Him for the things that He does in our life. This means that when you exercise the Lord's Word, causing the fulfillment, His fulfillment in our life, God receives glory. So whenever our prayers are answers, it glorifies God. And of course, Jesus says, if we abide in Him, His Word abide in us, we can ask what we will, and it shall be done. For by this the Father is glorified. And he quoted this in uh, uh, the book of uh, St. John, and I believe it's the 15th chapter, yeah, and, and the seventh, and then he gets into the eighth verse as well. And so if we abide in the Word, and the Word abide in us, we can ask what you will, and it shall be done. Uh, and it said, for by this the Father is glorified. So um, verses 1 and 2 in this uh, sequence of Scripture that we read in Isaiah 61, uh, is normally used to describe uh, the charter of the minister of the gospel in dispensing God's grace to the unsaved. Today, instead of focusing on the gospel in respect to the lost, uh, I would like to exercise the benefits that are available to the believer and uh, the attendant glory that is uh, brought uh, to Father God. Notice, again, a symbiotic, symbiotic relationship mutual benefit for God and for us uh, when we receive the answers to our prayers. Uh, when believers receive the answers to their prayers, the prophet Isaiah continues his scenario saying uh, in, uh, again, Isaiah 61 and 3, to, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes. Thank God for that. Beauty for ashes. The oil of joy for mourning, re reiterating what we read earlier. Um, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God uh, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. It describes a list of things here in Isaiah 61 and 3 uh, that the minister of the gospel under the auspices of the spirit of God will appoint to be in the lives of those who, are, who mourn in Zion. Uh, but before we examine the list, we must ascertain who is uh, being referred to by the phrase, them that mourn in Zion. I used to wonder about that years ago. Uh, I just started studying the Word of God, and I was wondering if this is only for the Jews, or this is for the Gentiles, or who is exactly uh, is he referring to here? In the Hebrew, the word Zion uh, literally means a mountain of Jerusalem. So a Jew hearing this would say, oh, a mountain of Jerusalem, derived from a root word, uh, notice this, meaning a uh, guiding pillar, guiding pillar. If you think about the exodus of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, the land of bondage, there was a guiding pillar by day, and there was a pillar of fire by night. And we'll say more about that uh, in Isaiah 48, chapters 48, verses 1 through 2. Uh, we used to sing this in one of our ministries quite a bit. Some of you probably heard it too. It's Psalms 48, 1 to 2, and it reads as follows. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. It's talking about Jerusalem, the city of our God. Um, the habitation of praise in the mountain of his holiness. That's where he, where it is. It's in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situations. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, the pillar. I want you to think in terms of spiritual terms. Uh, I told you it means a guy any pillar. Uh, if you're in the guiding pillar, the pillar of cloud by daytime, uh, you're in the presence of the Lord by daytime, the pillar of fire and the pillar of fire by night, you spending your time there, dwelling in the presence of the Lord, praise God. Then this uh, chapter, 48 verse 2, will be true for you. Beautiful for situations. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night, uh, the Lord can handle, the presence of the Lord will handle every situation you encounter as a child of God, one who's committed to Him 
and the one who's committed to receiving the bounty that he has and committed to glorifying his name and praising him in the way in which you live. So let me read it again, second verse here. Psalms 48, 1 through 2. Trying to make sure you have a better understanding of that name and that word Zion. We see it scattered around. Now you have a context from which to understand this word whenever you hear it uttered in the word of God. So in your mind, you should immediately go to the pillar of cloud, the presence of the Lord. Zion represents the presence of the Lord, the, the abiding place to the child of God. Should stay and live. And then the, the other meaning of that, the pillar of fire, praise God, in the presence of the Lord. So in your daytime challenges and in your nighttime challenges, in the times where you can see and understand what's going on, in the time you can't see anything, because the nighttime is dark. You can't see what's going around you. But by being in the presence of the Lord, you know that you're going to be okay. You're in the hands of the Lord. Let me read number two again. Beautiful for situations. That's because you're in his presence. The joy of the whole earth. Some of us need some joy today. Uh, you're in the presence of the Lord. There's joy unspeakable and full of glory. But sometimes we forget because of circumstances and the challenges of life that overwhelm us for a period of time. And regardless of who you are as a child of God, there will come circumstances and situations which may cause you to stumble a little bit for a few minutes. But you have to do like Samson. We're going to talk a little bit more about him, which means sunlight, a type of the child of God today. He shook himself. When he got caught up in circumstances that were contrary to what uh, he knew the Lord had for him as a believer. Let's read it again. Um, I, Psalm 48 and 2, the latter part there. Oh, let me read the whole thing again. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth. The Lord is the joy of the whole earth. His presence is the joy of the whole earth. Uh, Mount Zion, praise God, is the presence where the presence of the Lord is. The habitation of praise is in Jerusalem, uh, which is located in the Mount Zion. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. The city of the great king. Let me just help you here. The sides of the north has to do with the place where God resides. If you could go as far as you could go to the north, ultimately you come to the, the uh, place where God resides. He's God in the highest, the highest on the sides of the north. That's why Satan wanted to ascend to the sides of the north, to the throne of God. And take control and usurp Father God uh, during his sojourn in heaven. And he was cast out in Ezekiel, the 48th chapter, and he gets into that. Uh, he was cast out of heaven because he was trying to take away, praise God, uh, have an insurrection within the heaven to take away the authority and the power of Father God on the sides of the north. And so if you could go as far as you could, uh, just talking from a natural perspective, uh, you would ultimately reach heaven, which is on the sides of the north. The highest, in the highest uh, the place where heaven is, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, is in the north. And so that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, beautiful situations is the joy of the whole earth. Is Mount Zion on the sides of the north. Notice here, the city of the great king. It's significant because Israel, during the, their exodus from Israel, uh, from, excuse me, from Egypt, the place of bondage, uh, were directed by a pillar of, or a column of cloud, as I stated earlier, by day, and a pillar of or a column of fire by night. So the Lord directed them uh, with the, his presence by a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire. Can you just visualize this? A few million people in the desert, the Sinai Peninsula, walking towards a destination. They were not sure where it was. All they knew is that the pillar of God, the fire of God at night, and the, the cloud of God, that a canopy over them, would lead them and direct them to the promised land. A land was in the uh, Canaan land that they had been heard prophesied so had a many for many, many generations. Now they're en route to it, and when they left out of the land of, of Egypt, the land of bondage where they had been slaves for over 400 years, and, uh, and the Lord is leading them by a pillar of cloud. Can you imagine that? Just see it. And a pillar of fire. Praise God. Daytime and nighttime, the presence of the Lord was there to guide them. And uh, they went through all kinds of struggles and challenges. And the place that they were going through and treading, I should say trotting, was called a terrible wilderness in, to the promised land. And the implication is there's all kinds of terrible things they had to encounter as uh, the children of God before they actually reached the promised land. And, and as you all know, it took 40 years because of, they failed a lot of the tests. But ultimately, a few of them made it to the promised land, at least the, the next generation from the one that started out. And so in Exodus 13, 21 through 22, 
uh, it's in more detail here about uh, how the Lord led them, the children of Israel, as they left out of the land of bondage. Just, and I want you to think and correlate this uh, to yourselves. And the Lord took you out of bondage, and uh, there's a correlation between uh, the steps that you have to go through and the steps that Israel went through when they left out of the land of bondage, a land in which they had kept them under their foot for about 400 years. And now they finally released to go and travel towards the blessings that God had for them. And there was going to be some challenges they're going to have to go through and some development that was required for them to ultimately reach the promised land uh, over in Canaan. And we're doing the same thing here. We're going through the terrible wilderness uh, with the things that we encounter in this life, a fallen world that was brought into existence by Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. And the devil is the god of this world. And so his people, his minions sometimes are human. We have to deal with them in our jobs, in our workforce, uh, in our world, or in, a, in the country in which we live. I mean, from period, from time to time, there's always some war somewhere. Somebody fighting, trying to take somebody else's land, to take their resources, and take control of them. They're blowing up their cities, and it's going on right now uh, here in the, in the world. It goes on periodically all the time. There's always some war somewhere. Somebody fighting to take away what somebody else has. And that's from the beginning. If you go back to the second chapter, Actually, the third chapter of the book of Genesis, you'll see that it started way back with the twins. Praise God, that was born of Adam and Eve, uh, Cain and Abel. Uh, they were fighting over, uh, he wasn't fighting, Abel wasn't fighting, he didn't get a chance. Because uh, uh, Cain killed him before he had a chance to fight over anything. And so that's the way people are. And they said, I don't like the way you've been treated. You, you have more resources than me, and God blesses you better than he blesses me, so I'm going to kill you. And then you won't be around to get any of the blessings God has. That's the mindset of the devil. He's a thief and he's a killer. And those who follow him, those are their aspirations. And they don't know why it's innate within man to fight, to kill, to steal, and to destroy. The, the, the same things that are said in the Word of God. And Jesus spoke it in John 10. And uh, praise God that the thief comes, John 10 and 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And that word there. It's super abundantly more. So he come to bless you, praise God. But we have the alien there, praise God, uh, the one who's opposed to the things of God, uh, to, to fight and to resist everything that God says about you, to try and withdraw you from the things of God so that you cannot glorify uh, God in heaven. Praise the Lord. So then here in Exodus uh, 13, 21 through 22, it reiterates what I said about the Lord being the pillar of cloud, uh, his presence following them, uh, a pillar of fire by night, uh, always being available to them uh, to direct them to where they ultimately will go in the promised land. So let me read it. The Lord went before them by day uh, in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. Praise God. Notice this, it says uh, to lead them uh, along the way. And by night in the pillar of fire to give them light that they might travel by day and by night. So the pillar of fire was there to illuminate a dark time to get them through the night season uh, to the next morning, to the next day. And, night, and daytime, of course, there's a canopy over them to keep them warm and yet to direct them as they moved in the sky to the destination God had set aside for them. 22nd verse, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from them. Uh, from before the people of God. Now, of course, when they were ready to move into the promised land, then the pillar of cloud ceased and left. But for all of those 40 years, the presence of the Lord was there to guide them and to lead them to the goal that God had for them over in the promised land. The implication to we who embrace Jesus as Lord uh, that we are following the guiding presence of the Lord Jesus, uh, the presence of God. And... Um, here in the St. John 16, 13, the Lord Jesus is making reference to some of this. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth. So we're talking about uh, the Mount Zion. Uh, we're talking about the guiding presence of the Lord uh, in the day and night, uh, which is a reference really indirectly to, it's a type of the Holy Spirit who leads us and guides us. And so here the Lord reiterates it in St. John 16 and 13. So often, you know, I talk in code, and people say, what is he talking about? Zion? We don't have no Zion right Yeah, we do. We have a Zion. Praise God. We have a, 
a company pillar that's always with us, a presence from Father God, and that presence is no more, uh, is, is the Almighty, the third person of the Godhead, the Almighty Holy Spirit. And this is what Jesus said about him. It says, how be it when the spirit of truth is come. Uh, he made this statement when he was uh, living in his, earth, his earthly body uh, during his 33 years here in the earth realm. Actually, he mentioned this uh, in the last three years of his uh, time here in the earth uh, when he was about to be ascended on high. But just before he was ascended on high, he prophesied to those who were his disciples, uh, his apostles and his followers. And this is what he said to them again in St. John 16 and 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. So at this particular juncture, the spirit of truth had not come into the earth realm. But Jesus indicated that he was going to come. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So he said, the Lord can look over the horizon, uh, indeed he does, and he will direct you in terms of the steps you need to take, just as he did with the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire when the children of Israel were in their earthly sojourn, leaving from the land of bondage, uh, anticipating the future that God had for them in the promised land in Zion. So here it says, uh, he sh let's read it again. Jesus speaking, letting us know that uh, when he leaves, he's going to not leave us comfortless, but he is going to send us the mighty comforter, the almighty Holy Ghost, who's going to function uh, just as the, his presence functioned uh, back when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, St. John 16, 13. Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. Whatever the truth of a matter is, that's ultimately where the Holy Spirit will lead us. That's why we need to lean upon him and let him direct us, you know, and guide us uh, in our walk here as human beings and also as uh, those who have committed themselves to the Lord and have become saved. It says he's going to guide us into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. So the Holy Spirit is not talking about himself. And that's what's wrong with people, human beings, is we're so busy worried about who we are and how people see us. We forget about our charter. Uh, the third person of Godhead is, is a servant. He works, praise God, with the Father and with the Son to make sure that eternal uh, redemption is fulfilled here in the earth realm. Uh, but whatsoever he shall hear, the Holy Spirit, uh, that shall he speak. He only speaks what he hears from the, the Godhead, the Father, and primarily the Son. And the Son always hears from the Father. He says he doesn't do anything unless it's first sanctioned by his Father. So basically, even if it's just the son speaking, he's also hearing from the father because son doesn't say anything until he hears the father sanction it and then declare it. So he follows the Godhead and the street of bear witness in heaven in first John, the, um, the fifth chapter, I believe it starts at the seventh or the eighth verse. Uh, there it begins to uh, tell us those three that are uh, controlling what goes on here in the earth realm despite what men may say. Uh, people say all kinds of things, you know, about what they think. Uh, no scripture the Bible said is a private interpretation. So you need to make sure that you uh, confirm what you believe and what you think you know about the Word of God uh, by going to the Word of God occasionally. Now, uh, enemy's trying to stop me, but we're gonna we're gonna get there in just a second here. I, I want to uh, I won't have to go back to this again. So let's make sure we got the right chapter and verse. Uh, we see through a glass darkly. Let's see here doesn't want to change, but it's going to change in Jesus' name. See, the devil is here to stop us from getting to what God wants us to see. And uh, so I'm running into that right now, but uh, let's take time and make sure we get there. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, our computer that man has made. Uh, but hey, look what I have here. Sometimes you can't depend on technology. You have to go back to the source. Praise God, scripted writings that tell you what the Word of God says. Now, my computer is acting up. It won't let me get to where I want to go, but I'm almost there right now. I'm in St. John, the second chapter. Now, I know where it is, the fifth chapter, and let's go to the verb. I even have it marked here, 5 and 7. For there are three, just like I said, First John 5 and 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven. The Father, number one, the Word of God, who is the Holy Spirit, um, who is the Lord Jesus who retained his position 
as the Word and the Godhead and also retain his position as a son of God. So he has a duality in his nature that still exists uh, because he is our high priest of our profession. And so he has connections to we who are human being. And he also never gave up his connection to himself uh, to Father God in heaven. He just set aside some of the rights and privileges uh, for the time that he's here in the earth realm so he can fulfill the eternal redemption for us because a man was required. Uh, fully man functioning at that time. And he was fully man, and he was also fully God. So the Father, the Word, these are three that bear witness in heaven, uh, and the Holy Ghost, of which is the Holy Spirit. If you look at more modern translations, I have an older King James Version. It says Holy Ghost, who is the same person as the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. These three are in accord. I've gone through the teachings on that before. There's an accord that exists between them. I mean, they're one and the same being. It means that there's an agreement within the Godhead. And he says there should be an agreement, praise God, between Jesus went into that, to make sure nobody would stumble and have a, a problem. 17th chapter in the book of St. John, he prayed to his Father that we who are believers will become one with him as he is one with the Father. That doesn't mean that I become Jesus. It doesn't mean that I become God. It means that there is an accord between us. There's an agreement. If you look at the Greek word, which I don't have time to do right now, uh, there's an agreement in the way in which we live and govern our lives, just like there's an agreement between Father God and uh, between Jesus and Father God. There's an agreement between Jesus and us because of the way we govern and allow our lives to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So they're not one and the same beings, but they exist and they, uh, all three of them, Father, Son, uh, Father, Word, because we're talking about deity, and the Holy Spirit, uh, all three of them are one. And they all are in accord and in agreement. And we should be in accord and agreement with them as well in our living. Doesn't mean I'm God. Doesn't mean that I'm uh, the Word. Doesn't mean I'm the Holy Ghost. Just means I'm in agreement with them. So uh, just go to the sixth chapter. I'm trying to get into that today. St. John, uh, this, the 17th chapter of St. John. And it talks about uh, the oneness there. About what does he mean? What does the scripture mean when it says that we are one with him? And so they got whole denominations set up. Oh, but that one statement, and we got so many other things in the Word of God that we need to agree on. The devil does his best to drop poison wherever he can. And so you, you can't be ignorant when you're dealing with the Word of God. You've got uh, to gotta be intelligent, praise God, and rightly divide the Word of truth. And uh, no scripture is private interpretation. You can't just go on one verse. You guys look at two or three places and see in the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word be established. So I have to go elsewhere in the Word of God to make sure that what I thought I read and what I thought I heard is true. And so the Lord will sanction it with two or three other pieces of information, usually more, that what we thought we knew is correct or wrong. And so you have to drop and be more humble and realize that we're not 100% perfect in everything that we do. I'm pretty smart, but I don't know everything. The Bible says we see through a glass darkly, so I can miss it too. So we need to go back and check and double check two or three words spoken about certain things we think we know until we finally have an accurate view of what the word is saying. That's why I'm a word man. Those who listen, he already got this word. He always, well, it's the only thing we have. I mean, what else is going to govern you? What else is going to tell us what the mind and the heart of God is? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, but he agrees with the word. If you don't read, you don't even know that what he's telling you is in agreement with the word because you're not reading it like you should. And studying and meditating on it day and night to observe to do all is written therein. Then shalt thou make that way perfect. And thou shalt have good success. So, you know, I, I tell you, we keep getting back to the instruction that was given to Joshua, when the Lord launched him as a leader of the of Israelis, praise God, after Moses had died. And the same thing is true for us. We need to meditate on the Word. Make sure we understand fully. We may have a Ph.D. I have a Ph.D., but I, I wouldn't dare uh, conclude I know everything. I'm smart. I read it one time. I got it. No, you need to read it over and over again. See, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing repetitively the Word of God over and over and over again. That's why, you know, so many scriptures, I had some folks that used to attend our church years ago. So I heard that preaching about 10 years ago. Yeah, but you must not have got it. Or you want to go somewhere else that was teaching less. Praise the Lord. And I listened to them and sort of smiled. And I said, let's see where they're going. They left our church to go somewhere else because I preached the same thing from 10 years ago or 20 years ago. They didn't want to hear it over again. And then they go to a place that's so inferior in terms of what they declare. Very little word at all. You know, one scripture... Um, the whole, the whole message is preached off of one scripture. There's a whole bunch of scriptures in the Word of God. And I don't see how you can make one scripture uh, your text and not go anywhere else. 
because they're all dependent on each other. You have to go through the whole full thought. And to get the full thought, many times you've got to read the whole chapter. And that's going to take more than uh, one scripture. You might get excited, may make your, your hair raise and all of that. But after all, your, your natural response to what you heard, oh, that was a good message. And you ask the question, well, what you learn? Nothing. Praise the Lord. And then you get angry because you asked them, what you learn when you heard them doing, going through their antics, uh, their dram dramatics, which is good that you go through that. But when it's all said and done, was the word spoken? Did you hear something that's going to enrich your lives and make you better and draw you closer to Christ? That's the final uh, decision you need to make. Did I hear something that brought me closer to the Lord and opened the doors of my understanding so I can grow to the next level that Christ has? So that's what we're doing right now. I know I'm doing this repetitively over and over again, but you have to hear it repetitively over and over again in order for it to become yours in order for us to retain it without forgetting it. Praise God. And faith comes that way. Repetitively hearing it. Faith comes by hearing. Over, hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. Until you finally have it. But 15 years later, you may hear the same word again. It's trying to reinforce what you should have remembered from 15 years ago. Maybe forgot it in the interim. So the Lord bringing it back to you all. Bring all things to your attention. Uh, and to your knowledge. And to your understanding. That's what the Holy Ghost does here. We're just talking about the Holy Spirit. Who is... Uh, Again, let's make sure we make the connection here. It's designed for us today. It's the, the uh, guiding pillar. He is the guiding pillar that's with us through all of the ordeals that we encounter as human beings. Uh, I'm coming down to the end here. So let me uh, get back in my mode here. St. John 16 and 13, how be it when the Holy Spirit, how be it when he, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear from the Father and from the Son, he shall speak. He will show you things to come. So the job of the Holy Spirit is to show us what's to come. Just like the, the, the guiding pillar of Mount Zion, praise God, the guiding pillar of uh, cloud and the, the guiding pillar of fire during the time of the children of Israel uh, in their sojourn to, at this time, they left out the land of bondage, Egypt, and they're en route to the promised land, and the Lord was leading them in this manner. All believers are part of the spiritual Zion. And uh, Isaiah says in Isaiah 61 and 3, that if you are lamenting, listen to this, uh, there are a number of remedies which have been appointed for you, and they are, number one, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. God has set that aside for us as we're a believer. And we're mourning because of the challenges that have been dropped upon us because we live in a fallen world. The purpose of our appointment is threefold. For you are called trees of righteousness. Call yourself a tree of righteousness right now. Praise God. And believe it. Number two, you've been called the planting of the Lord. Call yourself, I'm the planting of the Lord. I'm a plantling of Jesus Christ. Number three, the garment of praise for the, you've been given the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That means that heaviness is going to come. And you have to put on your garment of praise. You can begin to praise and uh, turn on some of the good old Christian word music and listen to it. Do a little dance, a little jig in your, your, your kitchen. Praise God. Pray in tongues. Sing in tongues. Praise God. Sing along with the song. Praise God. Build yourself up on your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. God bless you, my friends. We're going to have to transition at this time. If you want more, I have more next week. Come back and we'll continue along the same vein. This is Dr. Nutt. Until then, we're going to open up the phones um, for those who are calling in or if you're already on Zoom, uh, we're going to activate the, unmute the line so you can call in with any questions that you might have. Right now, uh, I'm opening up the lines for any questions you might have pertaining to this, uh, the lesson today. And we're going to continue the lesson over the next few months. It's a new one. I don't know how long it's going to take. Next, I said months. Maybe it's going to take a month. I got quite a few, quite a bit of material. God bless you. Any questions? Sir, I have a question. Yes, Nina. sir. Yes, sister. Hey, oh, my gosh, brother. <laughs> I can do it for 30 months if you want. This is fire. All right. You know, I, um, I had got a little distracted, and I missed what you said about the word Zion. Yes. Did you say it was the mountain of the Lord? Uh, yeah, it is the... Uh, it's it's Mount Zion on the sides of the north, Zion. On it's the sides uh, actually, of the north. yeah. The, size, and the Lord lives in the highest on the in the north. Okay, 
if we could go, uh, if Sufi and I, if we could live long enough to get there, <laughs> we'd actually get to the abiding place of the Lord. That's why Satan makes a statement that he's going to send. He's living in the earth because God had given him custodial position over the earth. That's before the creation, uh, before the, the creation of this earth. Uh, and um, there was another existence that was in. Uh, heaven is always existent. And so uh, uh, Satan was living there, you know, as a, the most beautiful angel. I heard you talking about it before, jewels and his, you know, and the glitz and all of that. But he, he was unhappy with his position, so he wanted to ascend the throne of God. And uh, so he was in the earth musing about it. I think it's the 14th chapter of the book of Isaiah. You go there around six verse. Uh, he talks about that. See, he's in his earthly position as the custodian of the earth, as the God of this earth. Then the Lord hadn't stripped him yet. And so uh, he had access back and forth between heaven and the earth. So when I talk about the end, uh, when I talk about the world it then was, I get into this in great detail. I haven't taught it for quite a few years, but uh, there's uh, heaven, and then there's earth, and so there's this planet of earth was given to Satan, and so he'd go back and forth between heaven and earth. And so he began to lie on God and bring mischief to heaven and affect the angels that were there, and then ultimately the great champion angel, Michael, threw him out. Okay, he fell from heaven to earth, and uh, when he fell from heaven to earth, uh, some of those who followed him were like, uh, these were angelic beings, uh, one-third of the heavenly old host fell, and then, uh, I believe it's one-third, not one-half. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong there. Uh, fell. That's what I've been taught, one-third. One-half. One-third. One-third. So one-third fell to the earth with him. Uh, they don't die, they were spiritual beings, so they didn't die. They stayed down there, and they cohabitated with Satan. These were also... Uh, what we call demons today are actually fallen beings that were like humans, humanoid beings that follow Satan, who is the, the Lord of them that were here on earth. And uh, uh, many believe that, uh, I'll just say this, I don't have time to get into great depth, is that, uh, you remember that when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, you go to Luke 11 chapter, I believe it is, verse 24, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, I think it's 11, 24, I have to look it up, goes in dry places and seeking rest and finds none. So an unclean spirit is a demon spirit. Uh, this, it's a disembodied spirit. D notice that. Disembodied means they had a body, but so for some reason they were stripped of their body. The stripping took place when uh, the judgment came against Satan and those who were the humanoid type beings that were following him because he was the king. And then the, the angelic beings already didn't have a physical body. They were spirits. And so uh, that whole time, we don't know how long it was when the, the Lord came in and spoke to the deep and the life began to come back to the deep, the depths of the, uh, uh, the deep there in uh, Genesis, the first chapter, uh, third verse. Uh, but the beings were existent there. I believe they were in, this is my position here. I believe that those demons that uh, lived at the time that the Lord flooded, there's another flood, flooded the entire world and destroyed the kingdom of uh, Satan at that time, Lucifer, that uh, they were in that water all that time until the Lord come and separated the dry land from the water again. So they had enough of water. That's why Jesus makes a statement, unclean spirit goes out of a man, goes in dry, dry places seeking rest and finds none. It says, I'll return to the place from whence I left. And so when he comes back, he finds the place swept and garnished. But uh, he enters in, he takes some other demons with him because they're tired of water, tired of what, when they were in the water too. They want to go to a nice warm body and live in there as a host. And so if you, people read through fastly and they don't, they say, why would Jesus say that? He's trying to give us a hint about what, where demons come from. That's why they want to live in your body uh, rather than living out in wet places. So they like dry places, in particular the human body. And so, wow. so yeah, so Mount Zion, that was a heavenly Mount Zion. It wasn't one reconstituted. Jesus went there and says, I go to prepare a place for you. When I go, I shall return to you and, and gather you up. And where I go, there you shall be also. So he's building right now uh, the new Jerusalem that we're going to live in. Okay, it's under construction right now until the end of this age. And so they were thrown out. Satan was thrown out of Zion. It still exists. Uh, it's just going through a renovation right now to get it ready for the bride of Christ. So Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. That great big city we talked about in the book of Revelations that we're all going to live in. Praise God, that is the bride of Christ. The church is not the bride of Christ. We're the glorification of the bride of Christ. If you looked it up, it never says that we're the bride of Christ. But we glorify, and the whiteness and the cleansiness and all of that uh, is part of the adornment of the bride of Christ, which is uh, 
Mount Zion on the sides of the north. <laughs> Here we go again. And so, yeah, I gave you sort of a rundown. There's quite a bit that's involved in it. And so, uh, but I will just say this again, that uh, Mount Zion, uh, I'll give you the simplistic uh, uh, Hebrew definition, is a guiding pillar. That Mount Zion represents a mountain of Jerusalem. You go check it, there's about five or six mountains, and um, Mount Zion is one of those mountains. And uh, what it represents is the mountain of Jerusalem, uh, and it also means a guiding pillar. You see, the presence of the Lord is uh, what it has to do with. And that's why, in, uh, that's why I made the connection from uh, Psalms 48.1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. That's Jerusalem, the habitation of praise. In the mountain of his holiness, that's Zion. Beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole world, uh, earth, is Mount Zion. Why? Because that's where God resides. On the sides of the north, that's where he lives. The city of the great kings. Tell him right there, the great king lives on the side of the north. See, we sing these songs, and we sing these songs, and we know what we're talking about. <laughs> you, get, you, get, you get it now? I get it now, yeah, yeah. Okay, Zion is, the side, Zion is the guiding presence of the Lord. Zion is the presence of the Lord in the context in which it is used. It's the pillar of cloud that led the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. It's the pillar of fire that led them when they were in the dark spot at nighttime. It is the Holy Spirit today. Uh, and a type that leads and guides us. He's a guiding pillar. He's a guiding force that helps us night and day uh, that's with us to assist us as believers as we go through our trek here in the terrible wilderness, the earth realm. Okay. Oh, hallelujah. You got it? <laughs> I got it. Thank you, Pastor. So see, see, we talk about prophecy and prophetic word. I'm a prophetic preacher. What I've just told you is prophetic. You know, I'm, I'm unfolding what is hid for most people, and most preachers are scared to go there. I, I, some I talk to that all they want is one scripture. You gotta take one trip to the proof of the Bible and say that. And that's why I made the statement in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. That's said throughout the word of God. That uh, we can't be no one scripture preacher. And I know my text is not gonna ever be one scripture. So if you want one scripture preacher to holly kick his leg out and get on the floor and grab the mic and and do all the things that people, that had nothing to do with your life as a child of God. What are they going to do to make you supernatural, give you supernatural power when cancer strikes? You see what I'm saying? You, you, you need to know the ins in, in and outwards of your, the, 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 what God has given you as a child of God so you can act in faith. And then the question is when things come that you weren't used to, well, I can't sing a song on that. Well, ain't no song. You need a scripture <laughs> you know, to deal with the problem that's confronting you and then you have to know the scripture exists. Then you have to believe in what the scripture says. And there's no why you can believe now because there's many years be after what was said back then. And if you come back to the sermon, I'll be talking about then. What was said then was said now and what correlation is there? What do we need to believe so we can get the full benefit that God has set aside for we as believers? I'm a prophetic preacher. So I'm going, one person told me, I said, I'm leaving here because I'm going to a prophetic church. I said, what does that mean? They prophesy in every two or three Seconds of every five minutes, y'all having, uh, having a prophecy session for about a whole hour. Yeah, that's against the word of God. The 14th chapter of First Corinthians makes it clear. After about two or three prophecies in a session, we have to wait till next church service. So I'm talking prophetically, which means I'm not prophesying to you, uh, as Paul was talking about. I'm speaking prophetically about what he, what others have said has already been said. So I don't have to go invent nothing new. You know what I'm saying? I just re de declare what God's word says, but because it's by the Holy Spirit that I'm declaring it to, it's a prophetic utterance based on the word of God that already exists. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. You got it? Thank you. I got, I got it and then some. You're okay. Hallelujah. Any other questions? We have about another, uh, a little less than five minutes. But uh, I'm glad we took it. I'm sure people were listening. See, faith comes by hearing, so the question she asked, some of y'all needed to hear that. Now you heard the answer. Any other questions? I'll just say this and I'll let you all go. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. You know, I'm going to tell you all the inwards and outwards, because I was doing fine when I was not preaching or whatever. I felt I was doing fine. And uh, my thought was for years until the Lord got me, got a hold of me, I'm going to go to heaven, take care of my family and myself. And if the rest of them don't want to go, they go to hell. 
But I'm going to try and tell them, lead them to heaven. The Lord had to change my heart. So I'm willing to open up and share with people what I knew. In fact, uh, some of the pastors at the church I first went to who didn't subscribe fully to what I preach today, they do now, some of them, uh, they were prompted by what I said as a young man. They had never heard it before. And one secretly came to me and said, and he's a pastor of a large church. He said, Doc, don't tell nobody else. I agree with you. I was wondering about this. I'm sure glad you brought it up in Sunday school. So from time before I even become a pastor, it's been my charter to unfold and to unveil the things that God wants his people to hear. And that's what I'm doing right now. Y'all go with God. Until next time, this is Dr. Lynette until then. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.